George Kilpatrick, inspiration for the nation, celebrating people we feel good about. And October is, in fact, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we've been trying to get this brother to have a conversation <laughs> around this work forever and ever. His work <laughs> is featured in the work that I do, uh, engaging men and youth, as you know, through my work with Vera House. And we use his 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 documentary film hip hop beyond beats and rhymes which explores masculinity especially as it relates to hip hop byron hurt describes himself as a creator a filmmaker a speaker a documentarian you name it that's how he describes himself he can tell you more about himself but we have another connection you know i'm gonna throw up the hooks because y'all can see it <laughs> omega sci-fi till i die and you just recently brother, along I'm with also, your they, I'm, also, um, I'm also financial brother that, yeah i got my card in my pocket too right <laughs> there you go for real right that's that's important yeah it's very um, important along with uh and, and i and, and first of all shout out to your chapter omicron kai out of uh plainfield new jersey and the work that you're doing especially around uh, domestic violence and sexual assault and other forms of abuse in the recent uh, webinar that you guys put together, Misajamoir, we'll talk a little bit about that. But Byron, I wanted to bring you here just to, to really engage men, right? Especially in a particular black men. And yeah. what we need to be talking about is black men in this work of gender-based violence prevention. So let me start with, how did you get even involved in this work? Someone who describes themselves as a feminist, how'd you even get involved uh, in this work? <clears throat> well, really it was, it was by happenstance. It was not something that I um, went to college to do. It wasn't a, an ambition of mine. It wasn't something that I aspired to becoming once I graduated from college. I was a journalism major. I wanted to do kind of like what, what you're doing right now. I want to get into broadcasting. Um, and so that was my chosen um, field of study, you know, when I when I went to Northeastern University, which is in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, here's what happened. All right? I played football at Northeastern. And um, as a football player, you know, our coaches would always expose us to people uh, to come to our team and, and talk to us about, you know, their their world and, 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 and how to succeed in life beyond playing football. And we had this brother come to our team and he spoke. He was a, he was a former quarterback <clears throat> and he, um, Who, Donnie he also Mac? Played, no, it wasn't Donnie Mac. It I, wasn't I Donnie met Donnie Mac. Mac years later. No, I okay. met Donnie Mac years later. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he spoke to the team. I'm, his name is escaping me right now, but he spoke to our team and, um, he, he was a former quarterback in college himself. And he talked about being a black quarterback in college and the racism that he experienced. And I was also feeling like, you know, I was feeling some, some racism as a black quarterback on, on my football team, but he invited uh, the players who were interested in doing community outreach to come over to the center for the study of sports society. Um, that's led by Richard uh, Lapchak or was led by Richard Lapchak at that time, um, to just get involved with the community and to interact with young people in the schools. And I did that. I came over to Sport and Society and then they trained me. And um, and and that's where I sort of started doing like community outreach, community engagement. So after I graduated, I was looking for a job and I was I was told that Sport and Society was hiring and they, they had a new program called the Mentors and Violence Prevention Program. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was about. I just thought it was an outreach program. I thought it was like, you know, trying to reduce or eliminate violence, you know, in, you know, communities. I didn't know what it was about. I went over to Sports Society and I sat down with this, this white guy named Jackson Katz, white mm. Jewish man named Jackson Katz. And he told me about this program and that it was designed to educate boys and men about sexism and all forms of violence against girls and women. And I was like, okay, uh that's not really what i signed up for like that's not what i came over here you know to do and then he explained the program to me and he started telling me about how there was this real urgent need for more men to speak up and to mm -hmm. speak out and because i was a former football player um i had status in you know communities where other men did not have status and that boys and men were more likely to listen to me because i was a former quarterback and and that's that. And so he challenged me. He challenged me to take the the uh, the opportunity to be a, like a rare male voice who spoke out on these issues. And so that's how I got into it. You know, and, and to be honest with you, Tim, I wasn't I, I wasn't very confident at that point in my life. I was very nervous about taking on this role. I didn't know how our frat brothers would respond to me. 
you know, speaking yeah. up, you know, because yeah. I mean, I was still a young guy. I was about 21 years old. Right. And had and you so, already played? You you already I, yeah, I was a bro. I was a, I was a bro already. Right, so, right, you know, right. you know, bro culture, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, you know, <laughs> we got some work. You know what I mean? So, right. Exactly. So here, here I am. You know, I was I was being educated and trained to intervene and interrupt and to challenge, you know, mm -hmm. to disrupt um, situations where men are being uh, being abusive to girls and women or just being disrespectful, you know, calling women names that are uh, sexist or uh, derogatory. And, um, you know, so, so it, took, it took a lot to build up my, my confidence and my, my, my self-esteem in addressing other men about these issues. But I took the challenge, you know, I took the challenge because I knew that it was a real issue. You know, I grew up in a home um, that was, uh, you know, my father wasn't physically abusive. And I want to be clear about that. My father, I never saw my father hit my mother, but he was emotionally abusive. You know, he mm -hmm. was like a traditional patriarch. You know, he was that, you know, uh, man's man, you know, kind of a father. And, um, you know, I, I saw firsthand how, you know, my mother, um, you know, my mother was sort of diminished, you know what I'm saying, in a mm -hmm. household, you know, next right. to my father. And so I decided to take on the role and the responsibility, man. And, and I've been doing it ever since. You know, it's powerful that you talked about that because you described emotional abuse. You said it wasn't physical. But mm -hmm. if you listen to, to survivors, they often say that is as equally yeah, damaging to them psychologically. It right. It, it, it was damaging. I. And I, and I probably should, I, I didn't mean to minimize it, mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to be clear. You know, I, I didn't want to make it seem like I grew up in a home where I witnessed my father physically assaulting mm -hmm. my mother, because I know that there are a lot of young boys and men who actually see that. I did not see that. Um, I did see the emotional abuse and the emotional abuse was, it was tough. I mean, it was, it was hard to experience and, and watch as a young boy. Um, and it was hard for me to see my mother, you know, sort of um, subject herself or be subjected to that kind of a, behavior, you know, from my father. So and when you talk about this in terms of your observation of their relationship yeah. and, and and how does uh, and I'm uh, they still are they still both here? Well, my father, my father passed in 2007 and today is my mother's birthday. So I want to give my mother a, Happy a shout birthday. out for her birthday. Yeah. So when you talk about this in the context of their relationship, how does she react to it? We've had conversations about it, you know. I mean, we've had many conversations where, you know, you know, we just kind of talked about the reasons why, you know, she stayed in the relationship, why she endured some of the things that she um, that she endured. And, and what just, did she say? Um, you know, she just talked about how um, she wanted and felt like my father could change or wanted to change. Um, she didn't want to break up the family. You know, all of the reasons, right? Yeah, I mean, all of the typical reasons that you hear, you know, um, you know, you know, a woman or a partner who is uh, who has been, you know, abused, you know, what I'm saying mentally abused. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, she just, you know, my mother grew up, um, you know, sort of like a traditional woman from the South, you know what mm -hmm, I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, uh, sort of indoctrinated to, you know, sort of play her role as, as a, you know, a, a mother, you mm -hmm. know, to a, a patriarchal father. <laughs> you sure, know what I'm saying? sure, sure. Um, yeah. And, and so how did you not take on that in your own relationships mm -hmm. that what you saw? Because we know that when people see things like that, they mm -hmm. experience it as normal for them and then yeah. they carry that on into the <clears throat> relationships. So how did you not do that? I think that's a really good question. First of all, I said that my, my mother was a traditional Southern mom married to a traditional patriarchal father. I meant a traditional patriarchal husband, not a father. Mm -hmm. A father, my, my grandfather was, you know, completely, um, you know, not patriarchal. You know what I mean? Like he was, he was not a hyper masculine man at all. He was the mm -hmm. exact opposite mm -hmm. of my father in many ways. Um, but to answer your question, I, did not really identify with my father's like, emotional abuse. I, I identified with more with my mother. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? An experience like, I of that. I identified with my mom. And, you know, my father was also very sort of um, imposing and intimidating and could be, you know, emotionally and abusive toward, toward me as well. So mm -hmm. I, I identified with my mother. 
I didn't take on, you know, the the uh, behavior, you know, in the same way as as my dad. Um, and I wanted my mother. I wanted more for my mother. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, yeah. So, I mean, in honor of my mother on her birthday, I mean, my mother's a beautiful woman. I think that she deserves, you know, the absolute very best. And that's what I wanted for her as a young boy. And, you know, in doing this work, you know, I've been in many situations where there was there have been so many young boys and men who grew up in homes where their fathers were really abusive. Sure. Whether it was their biological dad, whether it was their stepdad. You know, I, I, I've, I've seen grown men, Marines, you know, cry, talking about the experiences that they witnessed where their fathers were very physically abusive toward their daughters. I mean, I'm sorry, toward their mothers, to their mothers. Um, so, you know, I, I can identify with that on some level, you know, um, it's not something I talk about a whole lot, but it, it is a part of my history. And that's, and that's why I knew that this was a real issue, mm-hmm. right? Because I saw some of it being played out in my own home. And I also want to go back. I want to back up a little bit too, because I, I said I disidentify with my father and I identify with my mother, which is true by the most part. But I, I think I'd be lying to you, team, if, if I said that I didn't pick up some of those characteristics myself. Right. And I didn't, and I wasn't emotionally abusive myself. I, mean, I have been emotionally abusive in some of my previous relationships, but I really fully, you know, <clears throat> I can't say I didn't understand, but I didn't understand the impact or the harm that I was causing or creating sure, until sure. I was called out about it or right. until I, I learned that, okay, these set of behaviors are problematic. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I had, so, so through my process of, of education on these issues, I learned, I had to really be self-reflective and I had to do the, do the, the self work, the inner work to think about how my own attitudes and my own behaviors contributed to sexism or to violence mm. against women. It's, it's, a, it's accountability and, and it's work that many of us are unwilling to do or don't recognize yeah. that we yeah. need to do it. So let's talk yeah. about manhood, right? Because yeah. that's one of our cardinal principles. Yes, and absolutely. Part of your work is to go around and redefine it. Uh, yes. But how do we do that? And what does it mean to you? Well, I mean, I think for me, manhood is um, constantly evolving. Um, it's constantly changing. You know, I think being a man means uh, that you have the ability to express the full range of your manhood, of your, of your humanness, really. Right, right, right. So right, it's right, not that right. you just wear, wear on your sleeve the, um, the characteristics or traits that are commonly seen as manly, like being tough and strong and being sure. a provider. And some of those um, really traditional ideas around manhood, but it's also it's also showing vulnerability. You okay. know, it's also being your authentic self. It's being compassionate. You know, which is something that you know this country's current president has the absolute inability to do. Um, if we want to know what toxic masculinity is, look yeah. right at that. That's or classic, right? t- classic textbook example of toxic masculinity. Now you talk to people like Gail Dines and, and other, you know, feminists, they'll say that toxic masculinity is a redundant term, <laughs> right? That right, masculinity right. in general is toxic. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, being, being a man mm-hmm. is just having the ability to, to be inward and to think about other people beyond yourself and be a compassionate, kind, non-abusive person. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you, you, you're perfect because none of us are perfect. Right, right, I'm not right. perfect. I mean, so, are you perfect, brother? Uh, I'm not perfect. You close to it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I mean, working I'm on perfect. myself I'm every not, day. I'm, I'm, Listen, look. right, right. Like, so you and I train, right? And the issue yeah. is we have to not only train and and highlight these issues, but we actually have to do this work. For people Absolutely. think, oh, we stand up here and we can just talk. Yeah. No, we actually have to be in relationship with other people and live the kinds of things that we talk about. Yeah. And it's often difficult because we also have to walk in a world where there are prescribed definitions about what manhood is supposed to be. And you talked about uh, being able to display the full range of emotions of what that yeah. is. Yeah. And for some people, um, it's difficult, especially for black right. men, right? Because we, yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? And I want you to speak to what for us, for real, for real. 
Well, you know what? You know, I'm a part of um, a men's roundtable group that meets every Friday, and it's led by Quentin Walcott, which I who I don't, I don't know if you know Quentin Walcott. Yes, yes, yes. Walcott, out of New York, yes. Out of New York, and he he's um you know he's I think he's the co-director of the Connect um, organization. I believe his title is co-director. Yes. Um, and so he runs uh, he leads a men's roundtable, which is outstanding. It's a, it's an incredible incredible space for Black men, mm. and every week we talk about issues that are affecting us from from week to week from day to day and it could be any range of issues i mean over the last six months i mean it's been crazy right, right? right i mean people's lives have been completely disrupted and affected in so many different ways but in this round table group i mean the one thing that um he emphasizes and it's like the first thing that we talk about is how we're feeling mm-hmm. right and i've seen you know because we do this work and we know that it's tough to get to the feeling part I've seen, you know, brothers really struggle with talking about how they feel. That's a that's because we're not really we're not really socialized to talk about how we feel, to talk about feelings because talking about our feelings shows vulnerability. Sure. And as black men, you know, we're already vulnerable, you know, to the society that we live in, in our communities, we're vulnerable in so many ways. So to show that vulnerability for a lot of black men is an indicator of weakness. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And also, you know, we're out, we, we've been trained to just suppress what we feel, right? And, and so this, this group really gets Black men to get out of the headspace and into the heart space. And that's yeah. the one thing I appreciate this group and, and, I, and the reason why I appreciate Quentin so much because, you know, he's committed to doing that work every week with, uh, with brothers on this call. Talking with Byron Hurt, activist, feminist, uh, gender violence prevention, expert, if you will, a uh, documentary filmmaker, uh, talking about masculinity and manhood and, and the ways that we can be fully alive and human and how we can protect uh, our own selves, but also our communities. Let me, uh, in the time we have, because I, obviously now I see I could talk to you for like three, four hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we just got to set that and up. Likewise, brother, and likewise, because it's it's rare to, to you know have a conversation with a brother who can um, can can fluidly talk about these issues. So, you know, I do appreciate that. Thank you so much. So uh, let me go to your film because there's two things that have converged and I want to get to it really quickly. One of them is, so in your film you talked about uh, uh, there was a, a, where and this this actually uh, uh, brings in your uh, recent webinar on misogynoir. So mm-hmm. uh, in the film you feature uh, Nelly who did his video at the time was Tip Drill and it yeah. shows him sliding a credit card through somebody's uh behind and and, yep. and and it led to a uh he was doing a bone marrow drive at spellman and it led to them uh not uh, having him come to be a part of that and he does a lot you talked about his charitable work as well as the work that he does as an artist and mm-hmm. i think he's still on dancing with the stars i'm not sure but um and now cardi b and megan the stallion have done a video called wap y'all know what that stands for yeah. so a, there's a lot of tension because a lot of black men yeah. uh, were like, that's disgusting. And it's yeah. this and this and that and the other. So I want you to contrast our reactions to those two things, because what women are saying is, is there a difference between when women own how they want to present themselves and their sexuality yeah. and, is, and, and when men uh, through their lens present uh, the same something very similar or is it very similar clear that up for us because i know that you probably were engaged in twitter around this yeah. issue Actually, i was not i was were, not you and, did you stay out of it well i mean i stayed out of it because i was I, I made a conscious effort to just sort of remove myself from social media and media at that particular time right so i saw the the conversation you know like i saw that it was an issue but i did not really weigh in on the issue personally oh here we but go but i'll just then. say this i mean i know i understand what some of the um complicated issues are i'll just say that first of all i don't i i choose not to speak on behalf of women and, mm-hmm. and, and like you know uh issues that they are deeply affected by because sure. the issue they, they can only speak you know for themselves in ways that i can i cannot yes. i will just say this mm-hmm. i was just in my car on my way to the mall yeah. um and i was listening to a song by rick ross and it was it was some other artist. I can't remember. It was another artist that came on, and they were they were talking about, you know, their their. Actually, it was Kendrick Lamar. It was right, actually right, Kendrick, right, Kendrick right. Lamar. 
And he was he was talking about himself in very sexual ways in relation to another woman. And he was talking about he just wanted to get his thing sucked or whatever, whatever he wanted, right? And I was just like, nobody made an issue with this, right? Because all he wanted to do was F-U-C-K, right? right that's that's right. the hook of the song. Right. And I'm like, nobody made an issue with this song, right? And there's like a trillion rap songs with black men talking about, talking about their sexuality, their sexual potency, yes. their sexual desires, what they love to do, what they love women to do to them and all this other stuff, right? And it's like this vast archive of that. Right. And then two sisters make a song that express their own sexual desires and their 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 sexual agency. And all of a sudden, it's like the world is coming to an end. Right? Yes. You know what I'm saying? And like they're being condemned and they're being, you know, derided like across the board. And so I just think that it's at the bottom line is there's a major hypocrisy. And it, it begins when we socialize boys to be sexually promiscuous in ways that we do not allow women to be. Yeah. Right. Or we do not, you know, boys can have as much sexual agency that we want. And it makes you more manly. It makes you more desirable. It makes you a, ma a manly man, right? Um, that other boys and other men are gonna respect and that other women will want to be with. And for girls and women, it's the exact opposite. And I think that there's some inherent unfairness in that. So, I, but I think the other question is, and I think that this is a legitimate question, brother, is whether or not, you know, women in the music industry, and the same can be said about men in the, in the music right, industry right, too. Right. Like what, what's informing those choices mm -hmm. to make music that's hypersexualized in that way? Is it capitalism? Is it a desire to make a lot of money, right? Is, the, it, is, is it a desire to um, play into the trope of being a hypersexualized black woman because that's what's going to sell? Or is it that you are just a, a free spirited, you know, artist who, wants to share their you know their sexuality right so, so yeah. i mean it's it's a it's a question that only megan the stallion megan the stallion and um who else was it, it was uh um, cardi b cardi b that's the only it's the question that only they can sincerely answer for themselves and speaking of megan the stallion there was also an allegation that mm -hmm. tory lanes mm -hmm. uh shot her and in the, in the foot and and there was also so this discussion around black women and the protection and not believing them if yeah. you will when they and this is brianna taylor right we can just bring the names up but yeah. so how do we um so I'm, I'm i'm bringing that in to say that was an issue of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, if you will. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, there was a lot of disbelief uh, on people. Well, did it actually happen? Well, how do we know what happened? Let me have receipts, all of these kinds of things. So once again, when it comes to black women, we all, we often reserve the trauma or, or believing the trauma that they've experienced. We, we, we don't give it the same weight. So how do we amplify and dare I say protect black women and their voices uh, around their experiences as black men. I just think that we have to interrupt those conversations by weighing in in support of black women and being, you know, a strong, you know, ally and um, and, and speaking in defense of, of black women and in support of black women. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of times our voices get drowned out by, you know, other men who are loud, right? You know, who either talk or scream, you know, about these issues, or they write in all caps on social media, you know, they have, they take really strong positions that, um, you know, may be difficult to challenge because mm -hmm. you may, you may be, you know, um, you know, you may be like a lone voice, you know, in a particular space. But I think it's important, you know, to use your voice and your intelligence and to and to speak up in defense of um, women who are victims who are legitimately victimized by. Um, you know, intimate partner, you know, violence and, and that sort of thing. That's the role that men who have um, any sort of consciousness about these issues, just, I mean, you don't even have to be call yourself a feminist. You don't have to call, I mean, I don't always call myself a feminist. I'm just a guy who, you know, tries to do the right thing and, and, um, and, and be a human being, right? Just be not a non-abusive, right? So if yeah. you're a non-abusive guy, right? If you're somebody who, sees women as human beings just like you, you know, it's, 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 you know, just go ahead and use your voice and confront people who are saying the opposite. 
which is hard for people to do, right? Because the culture, it, as you ex- described, is a whole other thing. And, and, and listen, team, I have been there. I have been, I've been the bra in the room, mm-hmm. with the, in the room at the hotel, with the room full of 15 bras and three women, and the three women are being treated horribly. And I say something and the bras come down. I mean, I've been there. Right. I've been in so many different spaces where I have used my voice in ways that was not popular. Mm. And it's alienating, man. It's, it, it feels a very lonely experience mm. when you're like the only person mm-hmm. in the room who, who speaks up and nobody's there to support you or have your back. Mm. That's all. I mean, I understand how hard that is because I've been there, you know, but, you know, that's what courage is about. I mean, and then yeah. and if, if you want to take it to our fraternity, I mean, when you use the yes. word manhood, right. you know, that's one of our cardinal principles. Right. And then we also have some rules around how women are supposed to be treated and respected. Right, right. I mean, like, okay, so are we living our creed? Are we, are we what? Are we this or are we that? You know what I mean? So- Okay. What, <laughs> <laughs> are we this or are we that, right? <laughs> That's that, now that right there, right? Yeah. It's interesting, I did a talk about that a few years ago and I, 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 I said something similar, because it was around the same topic and issue, Byron, and I mm-hmm. know that uh, it is. It it does take some courage, um, but but it also takes your. It also takes some commitment, and and in the fact, reminding ourselves what we said we were about, right? Because we, you know, we swear on some yeah. things and we forget some other things, right? But yeah. also, yeah. it's looking. It's true. If we if we, but then somebody was appreciative of that, and you know, you know what I mean. But it's hard, and it's a journey, right? Because we don't get it right all the time. And I think that's the other thing we have to be, be realistic of. Byron, um, with our time, let me ask you this: uh, one of the things that we also know is that black women, right? One of the leading causes of death, right, for black women between what fifteen and thirty-five, right, intimate partner violence. So, going back to this protection of black women and black men. Uh, and, and engaging men and boys to have this courage. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the floor to, to tell us what we can do, not only as a fraternity, because I think that was also the piece that you wanted to identify. First of all, what is to, as you answer, also include your definition of misogynoir or what you were trying to accomplish with that, because yeah. to me, that was an example of trying to amplify the voices of black women. So what can we do to engage men in this community, particularly black men around this issue? Well, I think that what we can do is to open up ourselves to the possibility that black women are also victims of oppression. Mm. And that sometimes the, 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 the oppression comes from us as mm. black men. That's a, that's a very bitter pill to swallow. Like mm-hmm. that's not something that we as black men want to admit or acknowledge, sure. but in many cases it is true. And, you know, black women are also victims of oppression from from white men too, white white supremacy, not just white men, white women as well. Right. Um, so I think we have to let go of this idea that we as black men are the only ones or are more, um, you know, repressed, you know, by white supremacy than anyone else in our families or our communities, right? So, and also you have to, I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges that I had, I've had over the years in doing trainings and workshops is getting men in general, not just black men, but men in general to just like let their guards down mm. and not be so defensive. True. And feeling like, you know, this is a personal attack against you in, as an individual, right? When we talk about, you know, violence against women as a, as a societal issue. And so I think, you know, the more that we can let our guard down and just consider the possibilities that there are really a lot of women around the world who have been impacted by these issues, um, then, you know, understanding and growth can begin to happen. You know what I mean? Like, you know, a lot of men are just not really well educated about this issue. And I had to become educated. Like Mm -hmm. somebody had to educate me. I had to read books. You know, I had to read articles. I had to have conversations with men who were more progressive around, progressive, than I am around gender issues, mm-hmm. which includes homophobia. Like one right. of my line brother, um, um, Greg Hunter, who, um, who who died, you know, several years ago. Um, my 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 line brother, he challenged me about my homophobia. Mm-hmm. You know, like I would throw around gay slurs and things like that, and 
And he would just challenge me and say, bro, why, why, you know, why are you referring to, you know, homosexual people like that? You know what I'm saying? Or why are you referring to gay people in that way? Like, you know, and he would just challenge me. And it was, it was like, wow. Like, okay, well, why do I use this language? Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes we speak a certain way because it's, it's just a common way that men talk. And so, and we don't really, you know, we, you know, we just don't get challenged about it. And sometimes we just haven't thought about it deeply, you know, enough to, and sometimes it's really, you know, it's designed to hurt and harm people. But I think that we need to be open to the possibility that we can change and we can grow and that there are words that we don't have to use in referring to women and referring to, you know, the gay and lesbian community and the trans community. And, you know, that's, that's where you begin to grow. Yeah, and, and the, the misogynoir, would you explain that? Misogynoir, very simply put, is the hatred of black women. I mm. mean, it's misogyny, but it's uh, more pointed toward black women. And, you know, you can see that in a, a, a myriad of ways, you know, um, systemically, structurally, um, black women being paid less than even white women get paid on the dollar, um, that, that men get paid. Um, you know, it's police violence against black girls and it's, it's Breonna Taylor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, it's straight it's, up. Yeah, boy. Sandra, you know, it's Sandra, Sandra Blaine. Blaine. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's the, it's the aggressive and maltreatment of black women and girls simply because they're black women and girls. Mm. Yeah. Byron, uh, what do you have coming up? Anything we can help you to promote? You've well, got books, you know, you've got films, I, COVID. My film, you know, my film about hazing is still, you know, we're almost, we're almost finished with that film. I'm launching a crowd, crowdfunding campaign, you know. Um, Where do we find that? Next week. If you go to my web cert, website, behurt.com, Mm -hmm. um that's where we will be launching a campaign it's not up yet the, the crowdfunding campaign is not up yet it'll be um next week okay so you know we're doing that and i have several other projects that i'm working on film projects uh that i'm working on um so you know i would just say stay stay in touch on my website sign up for, for my my newsletter at behurt.com it's the letter b h u r t dot com, and that's where you can stay updated um in terms of what i'm doing you, hazing, huh? You're gonna you're gonna yes. tell some secrets. You gotta watch the film team. <laughs> All right, that's Byron Hurt, man. Check him out, behurt.com. The brother's doing some work out here. And I want y'all to observe in this conversation, whether it's video or audio, this is two black men talking about gender-based violence prevention and Absolutely. supporting this work. It's hard work, it's every day we gotta do it, and some days we're better than others. <laughs> But it takes a little bit of courage. And, and Byron, we want to thank you for your leadership. Thank you, and brother. Rue to you, too. Rue. All right. for the nation. All right. Appreciate you, brother. All right, no doubt. Let's stay in touch. We sure will.